Hey guys, Joe here at JP Details, and today's video is all about my recent adventure which saw me cycling 1,200 miles in 20 days from Land's End to John O'Groats. For those that don't know where Land's End or John O'Groats are, well Land's End is the most southerly tip of the UK and John O'Groats is the most northerly point. This challenge called Lee Jog In Short or End to End is undertaken by many keen cyclists each year and is known as the toughest cycling challenge in the UK. I've done this ride in aid of a charity called Get Kids Going, so if you would like to donate, then please visit the description below to find a link. I've currently raised over £400 for the charity, and with the gift aid, it's almost £500. I've set myself a target of reaching £1,000, so hopefully with your guys' help, we'll be able to get there. So, how did the journey start? I left the unit fully kitted up on my Bergamont Horizon 6 hybrid sports bike and made my way to Stafford train station. I hopped on a 8 hour train ride swapping over at St David's in Exeter then onwards to Penzance. The train finally arrived in Penzance at gone 9pm and for the first time I had to navigate my way to the Lands End Youth Hostel in the pitch black whilst using my Garmin Edge Explore 1000 for the first time. This 10 mile initial bike ride was actually the first time I had properly ridden the bike, with it being fully loaded. I've got to say that due to the amount of kit that I was carrying and the surprisingly steep hills of Penzance filled me with an incredible amount of dread for the rest of the journey. I finally made it to the hostel at around 10pm and got my head down for an early start the next morning. I awoke at 7am, had myself a shower and enjoyed the inclusive breakfast before making my way to Land's End, which was less than a mile down the road. The weather was perfect, the scenery was amazing, it simply couldn't have been a better start to my epic bike ride. The route that I'm going to be doing is called the Sustrans NCN route, which does happen to be one of the longer ride options when choosing to do this challenge. It's 1,200 miles in total and is known as the Scenic Route. I've got preloaded routes on my Garmin which is broken up into 28 stages. Those stages range from 30 miles to 70 miles and link various towns, cities, villages and points of attraction from one end to the other. The first stage for me to cycle was Land's End to Choro which was a 47 mile bike ride that took me by surprise. Cornwall and Devon are notorious for their undulating and exhausting hills which when combined with the blazing heatwave that the southern parts were currently having and a seriously overloaded bike exhausted me to a point where I felt incredibly sick. By the end of day one I had almost managed to make it to a town called Red Ruth which was around 20 miles short of my first destination. I ended the first day feeling absolutely exhausted, I felt completely out of my depth and in all honesty I wanted to go home. I had very little confidence at this point that I would even be able to physically make this ridiculous bike ride. I pitched my tent in a farmer's field and had a half decent night's sleep. I woke up at 8am absolutely sweltering inside the tent from the morning sun. I hastily gathered my things together and quite literally dragged everything into the shade under a big tree. I was already feeling sick, I was dehydrated from the day before and I had quite a bit of anxiety about the rest of this trip. One of the biggest issues on day one was the fact that I had set out far too quickly amongst the adrenaline of starting the crazy ride. I was also carrying far too much gear which was weighing me down. My rucksack was causing me to sweat profusely and I was losing far too much water fluid. I thought to myself at the start of day two that I had to lighten my load. I went through all of my gear and separated various items of bulky clothing, tins of soup and plenty of items that I didn't see as essentials. I packed all of this stuff into my rucksack and then the first task on day 2 was to find a post office to get it all sent back home. I made a 4 mile detour to find the nearest post office and instantly after getting back on the bike after sending the stuff back gave me a real urge of confidence. With the bike being a fair bit lighter and the fact of not having this bulky item strapped around my back, i.e. the rucksack, made me feel much cooler and generally more upbeat. After a bit of a delay on day 2, I soon found myself back on track and headed towards Bodmin. I passed through a place called Padstow and what an amazing fishing village that it is. Around 20 miles shy of Bodmin, I didn't want to stay long but I did take in the views on the coastal path which eventually leads to Bodmin. 
stayed at a bed and breakfast called White Hart in Bodmin and soon realised what the quality of the room was like for 40 quid a night. Thankfully for me the bed was clean which couldn't be said for the bathroom and what made it worse were the little pots of milk by the kettle were rotten. I don't think I'd stay here again. After a warm shower and a cosy bed to sleep in, my next destination the following day was Bude. I had a fantastic day cycling through some incredible coastal paths and woodland trails. I bought myself a new pump and arrived in Bude in good time. My next destination was Barnstable and considering it was already approaching 3pm, I set off from Bude with the idea of covering as many miles as I could. I made it roughly one third of the way to Barnstable, however at 7.30pm I had to find somewhere to pitch the tent. I'd been cycling through some rather desolate crunchy roads for quite some time and found this little cut out section of woodland where I knew I wouldn't be bothered, or at least bothered by people. I pitched the tent on the rock hard ground, had myself something to eat, got myself ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. Literally two minutes after putting my head down I could hear something sniffing right next to my left ear which literally put my nerves on a knife edge. I thought whether it be a wolf or a fox, a bear or a hedgehog, a lion or a tiger or perhaps a midnight squirrel or a mouse. I banged my feet, I clapped my hands, I even made animal grunting noises to try and scare this predator away. I ended up going outside of the tent and tried to figure out what to do. I shone my torch towards the trees and lo and behold there was this set of eyes looking right at me. I was left completely speechless but those eyes soon disappeared after being lit up by the light. I got back in the tent, I wrapped myself up in the sleeping bag and tried to get back off to sleep. The sniffing started again shortly after so I began clapping and this must have gone on for 2 hours. I eventually woke up the next morning to the first day of rain, until this day it had been nothing but glorious sunshine. I packed up the tent and gathered my belongings before heading off to Barnstable. Day 3 of cycling which was a wet one and I was also in the early stages of picking up a few injuries. My bum was getting sore, my right Achilles tendon was hurting and my lower left shin would go through random stages of pretty bad pain. I managed to get my head down and covered some mileage before arriving in Barnstable in good time. My next destination was Dulverton, although the hills between the two towns were absolutely incredible. I managed it roughly halfway and after climbing this never ending hill for miles and miles, where I would eventually enter my way into a section of the Exmoor National Park, I found the most idyllic camping spot of the entire trip. Right at the top of this never ending section of hills, almost classed as mountainous, there were fantastic views between two huge hills in front of me with a town in the middle and the sea in the distance. I pitched the tent, had some food and got ready for bed whilst being able to appreciate the surroundings. I woke up the following morning to the start of an overcast day 4 and began the day's riding with an amazing downhill section. The first leg of the journey to Dulverton saw me cycling through a long section of the Exmoor National Park where I practically raced a tractor for around 20 miles. I made it through Dulverton and on towards Glastonbury which was a very tough day of cycling. I made it 5 miles short of Glastonbury which in hindsight due to being able to see this historic town in proper daylight the following day was a great thing. I found a local campsite called Lark's Rise Caravan Park and what a fantastic campsite that it was. Warm showers, modern kitchen and toilet area, soft grass and welcoming campsite owners. A good night's sleep later I've made my way into Glastonbury which again started with a nice downhill section. The Glastonbury Cathedral was quite the spectacle and the town itself was nice to pass through. Something I soon came to realise on this trip is that most villages, towns or cities tend to be at water level. When you go into a town it's all downhill, then when you have to come back out the climbs were often ridiculous, particularly down south. The next destination was Bristol which was actually my first target location to reach. I had previously been told and read online by a few sources that the hills in Devon, Cornwall and Somerset are the worst on the trip. I can vouch for the unforgiving nature of the undulating hills of the southwest pocket of the UK and was glad to wave goodbye to them. They had left their mark, in fact by the end of day 5 my injuries had worsened. I almost made it to the River Severn where I pitched my tent yet again in a farmer's field and woke up to the sound of two gunshots. 
I literally froze solid in my sleeping bag. The shots came from the other side of this relatively small field and then five minutes later a car pulls up and the one guy's voice goes, it's a cyclist. The left in peace with my life intact and I ended up having an okay night's sleep. I woke up relatively early the next morning with the anticipation of crossing the River Severn. I'm a sucker for the sea, rivers, lakes and locks by the way. I had a few decent sections on day 6 of riding with nice views across the channel which made up for some shocking weather. It poured it down with rain all day but an hour shy of Gloucester the sun did finally reappear to partially dry me off. I arrived in Gloucester in good time and stumbled across the Diglis House Hotel which was the nicest hotel that I stayed at throughout the entire trip. I stayed in the annex the other side of the main hotel in a separate building and thoroughly enjoyed my room service. On the evening of this day, after a warm shower, food and a bit of television, my injuries were pretty excruciating. I could barely walk on my left foot with my lower shin problems and I had no idea how they were going to be the following day. I tried to bag an extra night at the dig list to give me some rest but they were fully booked. I took it easy the following day to try and nurse these injuries and fortunately for me it was the easiest day of riding so far. I'd worked out for the first time my total mileage whilst at the hotel which was now up to a 70 mile a day average. My next destination is Bridge North and due to not being able to find a decent wild camping spot I ended up getting all the way to Ironbridge. I made it to the historic town and began my search with very little signal for the nearest paid accommodation. I came across the YHA hostel at Ironbridge and after a short cycle I checked in. I was offered a bunk room for £13 or a private room for £50. I thought I can't really turn down a bunk room for that sort of money so I felt up for the new experience. Long story short, I got to the room at 8pm, realised there was an old guy asleep so I couldn't turn the light on to sort my stuff out, I managed to get the necessities together to go for a shower, after that I went to the communal lounge and kitchen area to mingle with a middle aged couple. I went back to my room at 11pm to go to sleep and by 4am I hadn't managed a wink. This old guy who turned out to be deaf was an incredibly loud snorer and mid sleep farter. Needless to say, I put up with him for as long as I could before seeking refuge back in the communal area. I was annoyed by the fact that I had paid money to sleep here and I wasn't even able to sleep. I thought it best to redeem some of my financial losses through shaking the vending machine, although it would only drop two bottles of sparkling water. Shortly after I got a bit peckish so I paid for three chocolate bars, slept on the sofa for two hours before going back to the room at 6am to find that the old man was finally getting ready to bugger off. He left the room and I managed to sleep for four hours before being awoken by a cleaning lady at 11am and was then told that I had to leave the room. One terrible experience at this place but after a late morning's breakfast I continued my journey to Newport. Newport, in fact, is the closest point that I will pass to my hometown of Stafford. I have an uncle and auntie who live in Newport, so I had planned to stop by. We had a coffee, a nice chat and a few biscuits, and not once did I debate cycling the 20 mile short journey back home. I was having such a crazy experience, good and bad, so I packed up my gear, pumped my tyres back to optimum riding pressure with thanks to my uncle's electric tyre pump and continued my journey towards Norwich. It wasn't a day of setting mileage records thanks to the shocking night's sleep the night before and the almost two hour pit stop. Lo and behold I made it to Norwich and found a nice hotel to kip in for £60 inclusive of breakfast. I had a great night's sleep, in fact I had a shower, some snacks and then went straight to bed. I woke up the next morning feeling as fresh as a daisy or as fresh as a cycle tour on day 8 of an epic adventure which wasn't exactly fresh. Today's target was the city of Manchester which I was looking forward to. I navigated through the city and made it out the other side with only one close call with a muppet of a BMW driver. I arrived in Ramsbottom in good time to find a nice campsite called The Paddock. I pitched my tent, had a shower and made my way to the local pub. I learned one thing by going to this pub was that if you want a curry then go to a curry house. I had the worst chicken tikka masala at this place and I couldn't even stomach half of it. In the morning I packed up my gear and followed the shortest route on the Garmin to get me back on track. I followed the Garmin up an incredibly steep walkers path alongside a nice waterfall. 
It wasn't the best start to a day I've ever had. I fell over in two muddy puddles and my shoes and feet were absolutely drenched. I cursed whilst I dragged the bike to the top, then almost threw it over the fence when I finally reached the summit. I had sweat pouring down my face and I was almost close to tears. I had a better middle section on this day and pushed on towards a town called Borwick. I arrived pretty late due to not being able to find any suitable wild camping spots. I came across a campsite called Low Greenland Caravan and Camping. I pitched the tent in the pitch black darkness and was kindly greeted by a caravan couple. I had myself an early night and woke up relatively fresh the next morning. I packed up the gear and was invited over to the caravan a couple's caravan for breakfast. The wife nearly burnt the caravan down, but she did make a nice bacon sarnie and coffee. The next destination is Penrith, which is right at the top of the Lake District. On this day I practically had to travel the entire length of the Lake District, which I obviously did with ease. I made it to Penrith after some fantastic cycling and booked myself into the George Hotel for two nights. My first rest day the following day on day 13, not bad for 12 days of consecutive cycling, I made full use of the hotel's internal services which were absolutely extortionately priced. Room service was an extra £5, laundry was £33, a beer was like 6 quid, but I well and truly deserved the treat. I spent a bit of time the next day giving the bikes a much needed TLC after the first 600 miles of cycling. I sorted all my gear out to an OCD standard and packed up a medium sized parcel to send back home with a few items that I just wasn't using. By having the bike even lighter simply meant that I could climb up these hills even easier. I enjoyed the rest day whilst making full use of the creature comforts of a hotel. I watched the BTCC, spent a bit of time in the bar and had a brief walk around Penrith town. The following morning I began with finding a post office before heading outbound to Carlisle. As a kid my family would take us to Scotland quite often so on this trip I was especially looking forward to cycling through the entirety of it. I've been to Scotland four times in the past four years and even plan to go again next year. I made it to Carlisle, nothing major to report, and carried on towards Gretna Green. I did make it a little further that day and ended up settling for a Best Western Hotel just shy of Lockerbie. I paid £85 for the night, inclusive of breakfast, which was expensive, but the room was so modern and premium I just couldn't complain. The next morning after a fantastic night's sleep I headed out towards Abington. Something that I realised soon after entering through the Scottish borders is that the riding became incredibly tough. The headwind had picked up, the hills came out in true fashion and it was almost as if Scotland was making me work harder for the better bits further up north. I made it through Lockerbie, Moffat, Abington, Kilmarnock Hill, Stonehouse, Hamilton and Rother Glen before finally making it into Glasgow at gone 9pm. Almost into Glasgow city centre I was told off by an old woman. Where's your light she said. I shone the torch in her face and said there it is you silly woman, where's yours. I had previously cycled past the McLaren dealer in Glasgow which is well worth the mention. Some rather nice McLarens on display. I phoned around a few hotels in the centre of Glasgow and managed to find a room. 40 quid a night at the St Enoch Hotel and needless to say, the place was a dump. The next day I had a fantastic start to the cycle in glorious weather through the centre of Glasgow and out towards Dumbarton. I cycled along a fantastic stretch of the River Clyde before stopping for some late breakfast in Dumbarton itself. The next stage on the Sustrans NCN route saw me heading north towards a village called Balak. Balak itself is an amazing setting overlooking the Loch of Loch Lomond. The next stage would see me at a town called Klander, although I did have a southern section of the Trozax National Park to cycle through. The Trozax is one of very few places in Scotland that you are not allowed to legally wild camp in. In the past this area has been subjected to a substantial amount of antisocial behaviour mainly due to being just north of Glasgow. Cycling through it today the place is absolutely perfect, not one single piece of litter and the views throughout are fantastic. My only fear for the day was not being able to make it out the other side where wild camping is allowed. I didn't make it out of the Trozax National Park territory however at 7.30pm I had to find somewhere to sleep. 
I found an incredibly remote location with some awesome views across the lake of Menteith and I pitched the tent under a sturdy looking tree. I woke up the next morning after a half decent night's sleep and I wasn't apprehended by the authorities. The next day's riding started off with a loop around Calanda Lock. It was a proper MTB tail and even on the hybrid was incredibly good fun. I wasn't breaking lap records but the trail being there was a nice surprise. I made it through Calanda which was a lovely town and soon began a massive climb up a forestry commission road. The views at the top were incredible whilst looking back down at Calanda town. The next destination was Killin which saw me cycle alongside Loch Tay. I was joined by five firefighters which passed through the valley three times. When I made it to Killin I stopped for some lunch which was a tasteless scone but a nice coffee and cake. The next stop was Pit Lockery which is a decent sized town and soon after arriving I headed out towards the Cairngorms. When I was a kid my family would stay in Aviemore which has been my most memorable holiday destination for my younger years. We would always stay at the same resort called Spay McDonald so I was incredibly looking forward to getting to this place but first I had to cycle another 70 odd miles. I almost made it to the Cairngorms, in fact I fell just a few miles short. I pitched the tent between the old A9 and the new A9, plugged my ears with wet wipes and had myself a half decent night's sleep in the woodland. I set about the next day of riding with anticipation of the Cairngorms. The cycling today was pretty good going. I was filled with motivation from the amazing views and old family memories. I made it to the Spay McDonald Resort and had myself a quick look around. I took the incredible scenic walkers and cycle paths surrounded by purple heather up to the boat of Garton. It's only a 10 mile ride passing by some pretty cool houses. I arrived at the Boat of Garton Hotel for a meal in the restaurant. I had a jacket potato, cheese and beans, a diet coke, a slice of cake and some coffee. I left my childhood memories behind shortly after and continued my journey on towards Inverness. That day I did manage to make it to Inverness which was quite the distance to cover. I found another hostel charging £40 a night and without hesitation I booked a room. They sent me over to their guest house which was just across the road and I was in for a decent night's sleep, but bad toilet habits with the other person that I was sharing the bathroom with. The next morning I carried on with my journey through the city of Inverness which was a nice start to the ride. I was heading northbound, funnily enough, to a small town or village called Leg. Nothing much to report on in Leg apart from a nice lock, but due to being in the closing stages of the epic bike ride I cycled straight through. The next destination of the ride is a town called Tong on the northern coast of Scotland. I knew I wasn't going to be able to make it this far today but decided to put in as many miles as I could. After some fantastic riding through the highlands of Scotland I made it to a loch called Loch Staying. The current day of riding had quite possibly been the best day of riding yet thanks to some amazing views and forgiving roads. I pitched the tent on the verge of the lock and got my head down for an early start the next morning. I awoke around 8am and soon as I got out of the tent I was instantly surrounded by a swarm of midges. I hastily found my midge repellent in one of my many panniers and covered all exposed areas of skin. The taste of the stuff is shocking, I can see why the midges don't like it. I packed my gear up and set about the last day of riding with approximately 70 miles to the finish with high spirits. I made it to Tong in good enough time and stopped at the hotel for a breakfast roll, coffee and cake. I had 60 miles left to cover with the next major town of Thurso, so generally I was feeling quite good. The riding on the last day of this crazy adventure turned out to be quite hellish. The whole northern coast was covered with undulating hills and a strong headwind. Without doubt was this day going to turn out to be the worst. As I cycled the second to last stage of the Sustrans route I took in as many views as I could although all I could think about was crossing the finish line. I made it 36 miles short of John O'Groats where I actually got my first puncture. I pulled over to assess the situation and after borrowing a pump from a passing cyclist I got back on my way. I did have my own pump but I'll get to that shortly. The cyclist who I had borrowed the pump from set off shortly before me and 10 minutes after I set off the tyre went flat again. I pulled over in the middle of nowhere and attempted to swap the inner tubes. 
The new inner tubes that I had purchased from Treads were not to the correct size, so thanks Treads, you bastards. To make things worse, the pump that I had bought at the start of the trip didn't work. I became incredibly frustrated and felt completely hopeless. To make things worse, there had been a blazing heatwave for three solid days. I was unable to fix the puncture, so I snapped the pump in half and threw it in this field. I threw the inner tube in the field and also threw my helmet across the road. I did compose myself and put the old inner tube back in and limped the bike for two hours to the nearest house. Luckily for me, there was an elderly couple at home who saved my day. Me and the old man fixed the puncture and used his air compressor to blow the tyre back up. I lost three hours due to this last day fiasco and at 6pm I finally left their house and I still had 30 miles left to the finish line. I made it to Thursa as it was going dark so I stocked up with some food, had a bite to eat and then set back out on the final leg of the journey. The cycling continued with the same hellish weather, a strong headwind and rain coming in. I quite literally got my head down and battered through the final 25 miles. I arrived at John O'Groats at 10pm, I pitched the tent right next to the sea and got myself settled down for a half decent night's sleep. I woke the next morning to a misty fog and packed the tent up before taking in the sights of John O'Groats. The journey itself was absolutely incredible. I met so many nice people along the way. I've cycled through some of the best scenery that the UK has to offer and the sense of accomplishment, considering that I did it all on my own, was rather staggering. Prior to this trip I wasn't a hugely active cyclist, I did very little preparation for the trip in terms of training, so I guess the fact that I had completed it was a testament to myself. In total I spent 8 nights wild camping, 3 nights camping in campsites, 4 nights in hostels and 6 nights in hotels. I started the trip feeling completely out of my depth but ended the ride with the mind of a seasoned cycle tourer. I'm now in the planning for a London to Paris bike ride next year of 280 miles over 3 or 4 days, although in comparison to this one it would be like cycling to the shops. They do say that with an adventure like this then it is all in the journey and not getting to your finishing destination. I think 20 days out on the road was more than enough and by the end of the ride the thought of having to get back on the bike was just not a nice thought. The feeling of cycling through some incredibly remote and beautiful areas is something that I will remember for the rest of my life. I keep getting holiday blues about this trip, it was just that good of an experience. I've wanted to do the Land's End to John O'Groats bike ride for four years and I'm so glad that I've finally done it. I did this ride in aid of a charity called Get Kids Going, so please feel free to visit my fundraiser on JustGiving.com. I put a direct link in the description below for your convenience. So far, inclusive of the gift aid, I've almost raised £500. If you would like to donate, then it will be hugely appreciated. All money is going to the charity and they essentially help disabled children and young adults between the ages of 13 to 26 to get active in sport. Thank you to all those that have already donated, so we have Alan Reedman, Dave Madden, Jeffrey Godin, Gary Cooper, Helen Phillips, Adrian Francis Lang, Joseph Isabel and Grace, Mum and Dad, Anonymous, Mike, Paul and John Goddard, Jed Proctor, Joe Taylor, Ed, Dave and Pete, Sue Way, my uncle and auntie Liz and Dave, Siobhan, Anne and Hilary, Dave Merriott, Will Thompson, Anonymous and James Boothby. Thank you for all your donations. If you haven't already guessed then most of the images used in the video were all taken from Google. The images were selected based on the fact for the most part were either places I saw, towns I travelled through or to generally give you a better insight into the different types of landscapes and scenery that I cycled through. All in all it was an amazing journey, my only regret is not taking more photos and GoPro footage. I was more concerned on a day to day basis of covering as many miles as I could and not documenting the entire journey with imagery. Let this triumph set the standard for future endeavours. Only joking, I can't take 3 weeks off work in one go every year. I would like to do this trip again in a few years time, but in the meantime I'll stick with the more conventional type of challenge. Other things that I forgot to mention, I saw an amazing asteroid on my way into Boric which left me absolutely flabbergasted. One fighter jet in Cornwall doing random stunts in the sky, two police helicopters doing some form of training whilst being very low to the ground, 
a yellow Lamborghini Aventador with the registration plate BOSS, a couple of Aston Martins and Porsches, lots of sheep, horses, goats and cows, a dead snake on the side of the road and a handful of birds of prey including various herons. As always, thank you for watching, please drop the video a like to show a bit of support, please visit the Just Giving website and type in JP Details, all one word, or visit the description below for a link to check out my fundraiser. All donations are hugely appreciated and all money is going to the charity. Feel free to give me a follow on Facebook and Instagram, just search JP Details and I'll hopefully catch you in the next one.